Well, the diehards are still here to the bitter end, and uh, we appreciate you doing that. Uh, Jim, you can bring your guys up. Uh, we've got Lieutenant General Jim Pillsbury, who will moderate our, our final panel uh, for the symposium on uh, strategic trends in future science and technology. I think most of you, uh, uh, many of you heard Dr. Brothers' uh, fascinating uh, presentation the other day from OSD and what's going on in the science and technology arena. And uh, we wanted to wrap up uh, this year's winter symposium with kind of a look at the future in science and technology. And uh, my good friend Jim Pillsbury will moderate uh, the panel. And uh, we appreciate all you guys being here. Thank you. Okay, Jim. All right. We're short. We're short. Well, thank you, uh, Guy. Appreciate it. Thanks uh, for AUSA for doing this again. I don't, I don't know how many panels General Sullivan has sat through since he took over, but it's probably as many as General Solomon has. Thanks. Team, uh, as you can see, we're, we're a couple short here. Um, General Hicks and Dr. Rogers may or may not show up, but that's not going to stop us from... Uh, doing the things Rogers, that yeah. General Green mentioned in his panel with General Stevenson when asked what's the future look like, he says he didn't know. And I think it's the uh, mission of this panel to, to lay out what we think we know or what they think they know. And so I, I'm going to go right to our panel members and I'd ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, and we're going to start with uh, Mr. Singley. Uh, do you want to do the introductions in sequence and then come back to the yep. talk? Or? Please. Okay. I'm George Singley, and uh, I'm a consultant, uh, retired out of SAIC, and currently the uh, chairman of the Army Science Board. Uh, hi, uh, I'm John Joannopoulos, uh, director of the Institute for Soldier Nanotechnologies, uh, also on the faculty at MIT. I'm the token academic on this panel. Hi, I'm uh, Bruce Snyder. I'm with uh, Raytheon. I'm head of the research and development and uh, director of technology for our network-centric systems business. I've been in defense uh, business my entire career. In fact, I've worked with the Army for over 30 years and proud to do so. Great. And I'm going to stall here for another few seconds. Uh, myself, I'm Bill Hicks. I'm the uh, Director of uh, Concept Development for uh, the Army Capability Integration Command at uh, U.S. Army TRADOC, and I had right behind me Paul Rogers. Where did he go? <laughs> he was right behind you. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, General, General, General He'll Hicks, be back thanks. in a minute, so we'll, uh, we'll take care of that, but it's uh, great to be here. Yeah, General Hicks, thanks for, thanks for uh, leading this, uh, this endeavor, and uh, with that, as soon as Paul shows up, we'll... Uh, We'll, we, you'll know who he is when he shows up, we so were, go ahead and... and we were uh, commiserating beforehand, talking a little treason on some issues, so... We, uh, <clears throat> I purposely did not put my fingerprints on this board, on this panel. Um, General Hicks sent out a, a very good summary of what he, he's looking for um, a week or so ago, and with that, let us get into what the Army's going to look like in the future. Okay. Well, I think what I'm really going to do is, is challenge our notion of uh, what we have to do to make sure we look the right way in the future. Uh, and I'm going to uh, suggest that we are going to have to move past uh, incremental improvements uh, to actually achieve a uh, degree of, uh, if you will, order of magnitude improvements in our, in our capabilities as we uh, look to the future. So. Uh, so that you have some uh, perspective on wh where I'm coming from. My, my job at, uh, at ARCIC uh, requires that I look uh, to the future starting tomorrow uh, out to about 2040. And so I'm going to try to give you a sense for a, uh, a continuum of thought. Uh, and here comes Paul. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, a continuum of thought in terms of you know, investments we're making today, requirements that, that are on the Army in the midterm that we've got a posture for, and then looking at the deep future and then what I think that means uh, for uh, what we have to do uh, in the area of science and technology to make sure that we're properly postured to get there. Uh, 
we do this exploration uh, through a, uh, a series of uh, war games, uh, seminars, experiments, uh, studies, uh, leveraging uh, the insights of our, our partners, uh, both in, uh, in, in industry, academia, think tanks, our uh, uh, multinational partners, uh, those of the other services, and of course the uh, uh, government S&T community as well. Uh, to, to inform our thinking. Uh, but before I do that, I want to provide a little uh, perspective on where the Army's been over the last uh, 100 years and think about uh, what that means for going, looking forward to the next 30 years. So if I can have the next slide. And I know this is uh, not shown on, on the simulcast. So very briefly, the intention of this slide is to uh, think about how uh, we have progressed forward since really the turn of the last century uh, in World War I. Uh, the order of magnitude improvement uh, that we saw rolling into World War II, I mean the Army was a fundamentally different thing as we rolled into World War uh, II, as you would think from World War I, uh, foot-mounted, horse-drawn, uh, really the very beginnings of seeing the, the power of, of uh, mechanization and the uh, uh, industrial age coming into its full form there, but was not fully exploited until we got into World War II. And so the, the leap, if you will, in the Army was significant and I think bore out, uh, was responsible for our strategic victory in, in many respects. It was not solely a technological or industrial uh, revolution, clearly, uh, the academic work, the studies, the war plans, the experimentation, Louisiana maneuvers, those kinds of things were all fundamental to figuring out how to make the best use of these capabilities as we went forward. But then as you progress from World War II uh, through the Cold War, much of that was incremental. Uh, even with the near disaster that we suffered in the early days of Korea, because I think we got a little complacent coming out of World War II, um, we really didn't do any of the traditional uh, introspection and forward-looking that we have done in other periods uh, post-war, and we were caught flat-footed, let's be honest with that. And we struggled through the 50s, and there was a lot of incremental change. And if you think about the Army in the 1960s, uh, it was not dramatically different than the Army that we had had uh, really at the end of World War II in many respects. Not all, but in many respects. Uh, but coming out of uh, Vietnam, which of course was a, a uh, seminal uh, component of that period of time, uh, a number of very uh, bright and I think uh, uh, mad, and I, I mean that in terms of them being unhappy with what they had just come out of, bright people came together uh, at the senior level and all the way down to major, I mean, you know, Hoover Boss de Sega, I think was a major or, or a very senior captain at the end of uh, Vietnam as we entered the 1970s. But in a period of, of uh, great fiscal pressure, uh, <clears throat> we began to revolutionize the Army, even though there was not necessarily the one big uh, opportunity to exploit as we had seen with mechanization in the interwar years going into World War II. And that was a function of uh, institutional change with TRADOC, uh, the uh, development of doctrine. It took us a while to get to air land battle. I have to say when I was introduced to the idea of the uh, active defense, I wasn't completely enamored with loss exchange ratios as a lieutenant. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it was about leadership development, it was about training, all of those things came together to exploit what at the time were the most technologically advanced uh, platforms that we could get our hands on, and, you know, uh, kind of captured in the idea of the Big Five, although I think there were some 61 systems that actually were integrated uh, into the Army uh, as we uh, entered really the 1980s when money became available to actually exploit all the thinking and science and technology development that was going going in the late 60s and, and uh, early 70s. And that was a, again, I think an order of magnitude improvement in the Army. Coming out of the Cold War, uh, we made one really big bet, and in a period of uh, financial uh, stress, and the fact that the Army came down about 300,000 people, General Sullivan 
manage that problem and i think very well but at the same time he dropped about a half a billion dollars on the task of harnessing the electron and delivering what we call the network today army digitization louisiana maneuvers becoming four twenty one and then looking even further to the future with army after next and i don't know that that single investment and there's a lot of things that have been put on top of that and a lot of other uh, uh, technologies that have been tied to it night vision owning the night uh, precision weapons there are a lot of things that have come out of it so it's not solely the network but I think we're too close to those developments to say that that's had a an order of magnitude impact uh, on the way that the army operates but it has had a significant impact and I think it was the right investment uh, we we caught the information wave uh, if, in a surfing analogy, we were at least on top of the wave, not paddling behind it trying to catch up to it, which we never would have given the speed at which that moves. So th that was a tremendous uh, uh, decision to exploit a great opportunity. But as we uh, look to the mid midterm after 2020 and then beyond that into the 2030, 2040 time frame, uh, we have to ask ourselves, uh, what are the challenges and then therefore how do we posture the army to be uh, ready to meet those challenges uh, if we uh, don't think that far out we'll find ourselves uh, incrementally changing going forward and we'll wind up if you will with the army we get and not the army that we want and more importantly the army that the nation will need as part of the joint force so if I can go to the next slide I'll try to keep this brief as I mentioned, I own the, uh, the near term, uh, the mid term, and the far term in many respects. And we have a thing called the Campaign of Learning, uh, which seeks to integrate all the activities that the Army is doing in the area of experimentation and, and, uh, and testing. And so you see at the bottom uh, the Army in 2012-2013 with uh, uh, NIEs out at Fort Bliss and, and uh, uh, Brigade Modernization Command, the great work that's being done out there uh, by General Dragon and his team. And that's really about empowering uh, leaders and units at the tactical edge uh, to seize and exploit the initiative and so we can maintain relative advantage over our adversaries in a very rapidly changing and complex environment. And it really centers around uh, mission command on the move and, and taking the value of the very mature uh, uh, often fiber-based networks that we've uh, come to be able to exploit so effectively both in Iraq and uh, still in Afghanistan and provide that to a force to operate on the front end of, a, of an operation uh, not on the back end when the theaters become mature and that's that's a challenge uh, many of you here are contributing to that and have participated in NIEs and, I, and, uh, and uh, some of you have uh, bent my ear on that and I think there's a great deal of opportunity uh, which I'll touch on uh, when we go to the next slide here in just a minute. As you look to the midterm, <clears throat> so the near-term piece is about exploiting our investment uh, to get more out of the Army we have. Uh, as you look to the insights that are shown uh, at the midterm in the Army of 2020, uh, it's, it's about leveraging uh, that capability and understanding the emerging operating environment, the changing operating environment, the fact that we have a new strategy uh, for the Defense Department and acknowledging that land power remains central uh, to our ability to prevent conflict, uh, which is our first responsibility. And, and so we've done a lot of exploration in that area to understand that uh, being in, involved, as, you as I say, they're re regionally engaged, mission-tailored, responsive forces are fundamental. That's, that's our credibility. That's what keeps people who uh, wish our nation ill uh, at home. It gives pause to our en enemies. It, it, it allows us to attract and build uh, partnerships with uh, other nations in the world who have uh, similar interests to ours. It uh, creates uh, opportunities to continue to reinforce the great alliances that we have with uh, many of the uh, officers who are sitting in, the, in their countries who are sitting in the audience here today. Um, <clears throat> So there, there are some tech, technological changes that will, uh, we hope will occur over that period. The network obviously will mature. We uh, uh, seek to begin fielding a ground combat vehicle and a host of other uh, systems as we go forward. So the investment will continue, 
uh, but it's not going to be revolutionary uh, in midterm. But as we look to the far term, uh, we're going to have to find a way to uh, fundamentally posture the Army in a different way to respond to what is a very difficult uh, emerging operating environment. And we did a uh, deep uh, future strategic trend seminar, as the slide says, uh, in December. Uh, we did it independent of the Defense Science Board's 2030 effort, and we did it independent of the National Intelligence Council's 2030 effort. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there were a number of uh, a difficult conver uh, uh, convergence, points of convergence in our insights across the board. A very flat world in terms of access to technology, the potential for super empowered organizations and people, uh, the continued proliferation of uh, weapons of mass destruction, the continued uh, uh, explosion of uh, momentum in terms of human interaction and the ability of different actors to rapidly uh, coordinate and collaborate and, and take actions in ways that we will not an uh, anticipate. And, and those things will come together to speed uh, the rate at which events unfold that are uh, counter to the interests of the United States. And while the United States, in fact, uh, the French have just done a really great study on 2040, I think they said the United States will still be the most powerful nation. Uh, we will be there in a very different world, a multipolar world, a de-westernized uh, world in many respects. And so there's a lot of challenges. And the key input, and this is where we have to, what we have to think about is we uh, consider t uh, science and technology is that conclusion that's up there. An interdependent, rapidly changing, multipolar world will require an army that can rapidly deliver military effect at the speed of change with less. Uh, the competition within our budget is reality, and let's all be honest, budget is policy. Uh, we, barring some significant change in the environment that none of us have anticipated, uh, it is very unlikely we're going to see significant changes in uh, the defense share of the, of the larger uh, federal budget or the Army's share of that defense budget. And we have to figure out how to do things in different ways if we're going to be able to meet that requirement. Because the challenge in the far term is that we have to be able to influence events at the speed at which they unfold. Because they will, because of the nature of uh, the the actors involved, uh, and we're currently not. Po we'll just be honest. We're not postured to do that. Because if we don't, the ramifications, the ripple effects across uh, the globe, will be significant. And despite the challenges that we face uh, right now, there there is not another. Uh, liberal democracy rising power who's going to come in behind the United States and either ease some of that burden or take over that burden as the United States did as the, the uh, geopolitical situation changed uh, between World War I and World War II and certainly after World War II. You know, we were rising as others, uh, other like-minded nations uh, found themselves in a different place globally. There isn't somebody like that coming behind us and so if not us, who? And so what are the implications for that looking forward? So next slide, please. Um, what, I, what I've uh, tried to do here is, is uh, look at uh, a manifestation, uh, one uh, futurist articulation of the ages or revolutions that are either we're living in or are rapidly going to be upon us. And obviously we've been in, in the agricultural and industrial and atomic uh, nuclear ages for uh, quite a while and the information age now easily for 20 if not 30 years, maybe perhaps longer than that. And then there is a, uh, uh, an emerging uh, life science uh, revolution upon us and then there's the opportunity of mega materials out there. And I'm going to look forward to Dr. John Oppis uh, talking a little bit about that as we, as we uh, get into the rest of the panel. And why that's important is the Army is going to be expeditionary, and we will have to rapidly deploy into austere and unprepared environments. Uh, we will want to do that without establishing build, you know, points of build-up, intermediate staging bases, and the kinds of things where opponents can then take action against us. Uh, this is, you know, 
currently in the vernacular of the A2 AD environment. Uh, we seek order of magnitude improvements in the things that we actually do buy. You, the the uh, new systems, radios, uh, platforms, munitions, whatever it may be, has, there has to be a dramatic uh, improvement in capability because fiscal reality says we can't afford to keep paying for incremental improvements. Moreover, the enemy is going to move faster than we do. Uh, we've had a significant drop in the weight of armor pounds per square foot over the last 30 years at about 2 percent a year. The problem is the enemy has presented us with a 120 percent increase in lethality over that same period. And so every bit of savings we've, we've got in the reduction of the weight of armor has been consumed by the fact that we have to add more to it, more of it to the platform to protect the crew or the infantrymen in, in there so that they can survive the initial uh, contact and then press forward to, to defeat the enemy and, and then transition on to the next fight which is a problem because we get no weight reduction. In fact, we may get a weight increase and there are all the attendant issues of power and fuel consumption and, all, and then the logistics tail that comes with that. We don't have any, we have marginal to no improvement in that aspect of how we organize and fight. And then the last piece is that all the things that we uh, uh, begin to exploit now must reduce the burden on the soldier the leader, the organization, and the systems that they use. So swap C should not be a problem. It is right now, but it should not be a problem. We have to build systems that make it uh, no longer a problem. Uh, the interface, digital natives, these are young soldiers, men and women out there who have grown up in the information age, should not be frustrated by the systems they have because they should operate as they're used to operating with commercial technology and it should be intuitive to them so that they devote almost no time to making the system work and they devote all their time to leveraging what that system can do for them and so on. <clears throat> so looking to the deeper future and being able to uh, wind up with an army that can respond uh, rapidly to events as they unfold, uh, meet the needs of the nation in that uh, future I described with less uh, there are really three areas that I think we have to, to focus on, <clears throat> and it's uh, embodied in those last three uh, revolutions or uh, ages that are shown on the chart. Uh, the first one is uh, the information age. Uh, we uh, have made a significant investment. Uh, I think we've only scratched the surface of the potential of this, particularly as, as things move uh, so rapidly, uh, but we have to continue to invest in the, uh, the network and all that it can do for us and it needs to do more. Uh, some of the folks who have talked to me have said, you know, I could give you uh, iPhone-like capability except the requirements process kind of gets in the way of that. And I can't exploit this opportunity because the requirement, there is no requirement articulated in it. Well, if we can't exploit the opportunity, then we're not fully leveraging this information, the power of information, which is a significant force multiplier. Again, not yet perhaps an order of magnitude improvement, but very close life sciences and all the things that go with that. <clears throat> That's about raising uh, the performance of our number one investment in the United States Army. Fifty percent of our budget is devoted to people. And yet, when we talk about soldier as a system, what we're really talking about is the widgets that we put on the soldier, <clears throat> not the soldier himself. The soldier or herself. The soldier should be a programmer record. We spend more money on the soldier than we do on anything else. And we need to begin to take advantage of this emerging field of brain science and uh, the ability to raise their uh, physical and cognitive performance to maximize their military and social skills so that they can operate and be more effective. And as importantly, to talk about the information age, the network allows us to integrate information and to reach up into the joint community and drag all that capability down to very low levels. But in many cases, we have not invested in the soldier and leader to raise their game to be able to uh, have the maturity, the judgment, and the experience to be able to exploit that fully. And so we reserve authorities at higher levels when in fact it could be done at the captain, lieutenant, and sergeant level. So we have to figure out how to make these young people uh, 
like 35 to 40 year old uh, special operators in terms of their judgment experience. And then finally, mega materials. If we don't change the materials that we make the things that the Army uses uh, out of, we're not going to fundamentally change uh, the deployability, the sustainability of the Army. And most importantly, if we can't do that, we're going to wind up with a one-third, two-thirds relationship between tooth to tail from now and until uh, the cows come home. We've got to be able to flatten that or invert it going forward. And, and I believe that this is an area where we, we do not sacrifice the fact that the Army is the male fist of the, United, of the United States Armed Forces, but we've got to be able to give that punch and weigh less at the same time. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Well done. <clears throat> Could you uh, introduce yourself? Sure, thank you. My name is Paul Rogers. I'm the director for the Tank Automotive Research Development and Engineering Center in Detroit. Uh, and to be quite honest, this has been my dream job and I'm happy to have it. So hopefully I can hold on to it and not get fired anytime soon. <laughs> There's uh, you know, a lot of energy, and you heard it for the first couple days here, uh, a lot of energy going into discussions about sequestration, the continuing resolution, uh, significant transitions of programs of record from production to sustainment, government furloughs, and there's been a lot of downsizing on the industry side. And it's a very difficult time for all of us to manage through. And it really, that, that can consume us if we allow it to. So that's why I think I have the, the best job in the Army today, because as I get worn down from those discussions, I leave my office and I go out into the labs and I get to engage with the young engineers and scientists who are excited every day about the innovations that they're working on and some of the disruptive ideas they have for moving our, our ground platforms forward. So it helps me energize. Uh, re-energize and, and refocus on the future. And I want to share a few thoughts today about that future and some of the challenges we have uh, from a technological perspective. So, you know, there's a couple aspects of what's going on today that make me very excited about the potential of our future. The number one thing is a process perspective, and it's what the Miss Shu is doing with the long-range strategy. And this is long overdue for us. And if you haven't been in the S&T world at all, you don't appreciate the impact of a long-term S&T strategy tied to the long-term acquisition strategy. This is a paradigm shift for us, and it's been long overdue, as I said. So she is taking our focus from three to five years, and she's now trying to extend it to the third decade. And there's a lot of uncertainty as you do that. But there's a lot of opportunity as it helps us reshape our investments, help us prioritize and discuss the vehicles of the future, the future tank, the future whatever we want to discuss. So this is a game changer and it's a great opportunity for us in the S&T world. So we're very excited by that and uh, willingly participating as we move forward. Uh, I think the other thing we need to be excited about is the last 12 years of investment. There has been significant technological advancement and we have not yet fully taken advantage of all that investment that exists within academia and which exists within our industry partners and our government laboratories. So we have an opportunity now to try to reshape those advancements into the concepts of the future and our new future vehicle systems. And we're positioned and postured to do that. So I think there's an exciting opportunity there. And there's four areas we talk about. Uh, preventing surprise for the soldier, extending the soldier reach, mitigating risk, and then reducing soldier burden, both physical and cognitive burden. And I think if we use those four themes to shape our investments and shape our discussions, we are not only advancing our technology, but we're also directly impacting the soldier at the end of the day. So those four themes are helping guide some of our innovative discussions inside. And I'd also like to just say, you know, from my perspective, my opinion, I guess, you know, with every, all the uncertainty and all the complexity driven by our budget challenges, this is the time to be aggressive. This is the time to challenge our existing paradigms, not only from a process perspective, but from a vehicle design perspective, not only from a science and technology investment, but also on the requirement side and our con ops and our doctrine. This is the time that we should be driving hard and taking risk 
manageable risk, but taking risk nonetheless, and really challenging ourselves and where we are today and whether we are taking full advantage of the potential of our technology. So in order to illustrate this point, I want to use the, the topic of vehicle weight um, just, just again to guide the illustration. I could have used robotics, I could have used vehicle architecture, several things, but vehicle weight I will use because there's some good analogies I can draw out of that. So, so bear with me as I go through these next couple charts. Next chart, please. So this chart kind of characterizes the last 30 or 40 years and where we are today. And as we start to talk about the vehicle weight issue and why are we driving up to that 70 ton plat, you know, plateau across our platforms, it's driven by this change over the last uh, decade or so, actually three decades if you look at it. We, are, we did have, as General Hicks pointed out, significant advances in material science. And I'm going to show you on a, a chart in a moment here uh, what that, how that measures out for us, but there has been significant advancements in, in our, our weight efficiencies of our platforms. However, in the top bubbles there, what you see is that we have fundamentally changed our protection uh, process. We are looking at a frontal arc with our systems of the 80s. In the 2000s, we started to look at more of a hemisphere. So now we had greater protection requirements around the pl platform, and now today we're looking at it as a form of a sphere. We also have underbody, per, underbelly protection that drives our vehicle designs. So we have fundamentally changed the protection requirements in, in uh, definition for our platforms. So while we're making those material science advancements, we are also significantly increasing our requirements. And that's where, if, at the end of the day, our vehicle weights have gone up in response to that. If you look at the pie charts, hopefully you can read, read that. Uh, the hull in the turret, the structure in the armor are the significant drivers for a ground vehicle platform, a, a, a ground combat vehicle platform. And it represents about 65% of the weight of the vehicle. So 65% of the weight of the vehicle is that structure and armor. Now if you take that 65% and you break it out, the uh, pie chart on the other side of the, the uh, schematic here shows you where that gets distributed and it shows you what goes to hulls, the weldments, the appendages and it gives you a breakout. So as we start to look at where can we affect the weight of our platform from a material science perspective we can narrow down through these simple schematics into where we can have the greatest impact and it really comes down to that hull armor solution. So if we strictly want to stay with a material solution for protection, that's our focus. And that's where we have the greatest bang for the buck right there. Next slide, please. So now this, this chart can be misinterpreted in about 10 different ways. And I want to <laughs> caution you. And it may take you know, the dialogue outside to, to really appreciate the uh, complexity and the, the funny math that's hidden in this chart. So I will try to describe it, but I caution don't... Uh, don't run off and pass judgment too quickly. So if you look at the fourth red dot from the y-axis, that's essentially our weight of a ground vehicle system today given the requirements I referenced on the previous chart. If we were to have those exact same requirements 30 years earlier, our weight would be the first red dot from the y-axis and we would have been about 20 tons heavier. So that reduction in weight is contributed to the advancements in the material sciences. Okay, now, nobody got up and left so, <laughs> so, so far. You're either intrigued or confused. So. Uh, now, we have ways of reducing weight. If weight reduction is our strategic goal, we can reduce weight. If you look at that blue line that goes vertically, we can reduce weight by taking armor packages off. We went to kitted solutions over the last decade. It's the right thing to do because it gives us the flexibility to modify our vehicle system for the scenario we're in, the threat environment we're in. So we can reduce the weight 20, 25 tons by removing kitted solutions. But what you're doing there is giving up armor protection. So, you know, a lot of scenarios we can't afford to do that. So now we're stuck back up on the red line if you can't give up your vehicle protection. When we talk about material sciences, we have to continue to invest in material sciences. It's fundamental to what we do. 
But if you look at the red line as it extends out into the dashed area, if we keep the relative advancements we've seen over the last 30 years, some maybe diminishing returns based on what we're hearing from material scientists, we can expect maybe four, five, six tons reduction over the next 30 years, unless there's a disruptive breakthrough. And that's what I show with the little dashed line that goes down and then off to the side of the chart. That represents about a 10% change in the vehicle weight. That would be disruptive in the material science community right now. So if you still look at it, we're still too heavy even given that type of disruptive breakthrough. So what I, when I'm working with uh, the uh, TRADOC community, I want to start driving the discussion into the blue dots and have them consider that there are other ways to drive weight out of a vehicle system. But when we do that, we now have risks that we have to mitigate in other ways. And we have risks that are carried by other technologies when it comes to vehicle protection. We need to be prepared to deal with that. And, and if we want to go down the, the blue dots, if you look down some of them, uh, the second uh, blue uh, triangle down is layered survivability. And we, we all know what that is. It's reliance on active protection systems, signature management, those types of technologies. The concern always is you come around a corner and you're in a gunfight nose to nose, those technologies don't do a lot for you anymore. So how do we mitigate those risks? How do we transfer the risk of that engagement into some other technology and still give us the confidence in our platform? That's the discussion that we have to have and it has to be a real discussion if weight reduction is our goal. The next blue diamond down is reduced under armor volume. Now that can be interpreted in many different ways. Smaller crew, you know, less soldiers in the platform, less protected volume. There are strategies where we can take risk in the mobility aspects of a vehicle system if we want to protect the crew. So there are opportunities there if we're willing to make the requirements trades and, and again address it from a holistic perspective, not just a material solution perspective. And then if you really want to get down to a 20 ton platform, let's take the soldier completely out of it and let's leverage autonomy and robotic systems. Again, I have this spread out over time because it's going to take time to build the confidence, the reliability, and the acceptance of those technological approaches. But if you really want to go after vehicle weight in a disruptive manner, material science is an aspect of it, but we really need to start challenging our doctrine, our CONOPS, and our reliance on other technological means. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so as we start to, uh, if, if we even want to start considering that aggressively and going after that, we really need to start looking at a little slightly more aggressive collaborative model, which is represented here. A material solution on the S&T side is an interesting science project if we are not synchronized with a future program of record on the long-term strategy, and if we don't have the operational side of our Army and the TRADOC community involved with the development of those technologies. We have, for you know, over 24 years of my experience, we've done a lot of technological advancements, and at the end of the day, it doesn't hold, it's not a credible solution that's acceptable to the operational Army, and it ends up stopping at that point. So the collaboration has to occur real time in our S&T development programs in order to get to an acceptable solution so that the warfighter under, understands the risks and understands how to mitigate the risks either through TTPs, CONOPS, doctrine, whatever phrase you want to use. So we have to start looking at a tighter collaboration among these three entities. And of course, industry is significantly a part of that and I think the industry involvement in RDECOM is a, is a must. We cannot be successful without our industry partners, and I don't think eventually they will be successful without involvement with the R&D community. Next slide, please. So I just want, in the interest of time, I just, uh, you know, I think this is a time to take risk. I think this is a time where we need to uh, incentivize ourselves uh, to take risk. 
The longer planning horizons allow us to do that. I think the public-private collaborations are necessary to do that. We can't put, in my opinion, all of that technical risk and the cost of it on the industry. It has to be shared among both parties. And true transition of technology does not happen between me and a PM or a PEO. It happens between me and an industry partner that then takes that technology and integrates it into a solution that they sell back to the Army. So I think we need to change that paradigm. And we also need to synchronize our S&T investment with the acquisition community and do the pre-milestone A work where we are driving risk out of the cost and the schedule of our platforms. Uh, I, I just I have some pictures up here. They're, they're purely to drive the thought process. Uh, but within TARDEC, we are looking at many different innovative approaches from a manufacturing perspective, from a vehicle flexibility perspective. We are also looking at vehicle, and our, our buzz phrase is vehicle is a member of a squad. And I think General Hicks touched on this in a couple different ways. I don't believe today we are fully embracing the capacity, the full capacity of our ground vehicle systems and the technology that's within them. And I think we can design the systems to be a member of the squad, if you will, that takes cognitive burden off of our soldiers, that takes in data, synthesizes data, and provides actionable information back to that squad leader or that track commander. So we are looking aggressively at that, how we do that, and how we tie in unmanned aerial vehicles, unmanned ground vehicles, and other platforms that can provide us that situational awareness. Sir, with that, I will Good. stop. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Rogers, appreciate it. George? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, General Sullivan, thanks for the invitation. Uh, General Hicks, uh, appreciate the invite from you as well. I'm going to try to, uh, I, I was a little bit worried uh, coming into this that maybe I was going to be odd man out because I'm uh, mildly optimistic uh, about this upcoming period, having been through a couple of them before. Um, I guess I'm in the same camp as General Barkley, if you heard him earlier, and that is that even though times are tough, we've been here before and the glass is half full. So uh, the title of my presentation is uh, Future Readiness, so that we can prevent, shape, and win uh, both the RDA challenges as well as the opportunities. And within the challenges, uh, we certainly are challenged by fiscal austerity. Uh, we've seen a lot of restructuring and reengineering of processes in the past, uh, but this time it's truly different. Uh, because we don't have a peace dividend as allegedly we had in the 90s. Uh, in fact, uh, the world is a lot more uncertain. Uh, technology uh, development is coming from uh, non-traditional sources, if you will, and uh, the world is much more volatile. Uh, there's been an excellent uh, publication, which I drew on for, uh, for my remarks, uh, put out by the former Secretary of the Navy, Richard Danzig, and the title of that publication or that study uh, is driving in the dark, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And I guess the third challenge that I would throw out there is the globalization of technology and innovation, uh, not just the creation or the generation of technology and uh, innovation, but the fact that it's become, as we've seen uh, all too sad in the last uh, decade or so, very readily available uh, to our potential adversaries and also the disruptiveness of technology coming from uh, non-traditional uh, defense sources. On the opportunity side, uh, this is a time, just like Wick Murray talked about in the interwar years between World War I and World War II, and just like I'll show you in the upcoming slide, this is the time to be regenerating our strategy. That's a phrase that's used by Professor Gary Hamill in his book about competing for the future. Um, Ms. Shu uh, in ASALT and TRADOC and others are, uh, and General Cohn, as you heard from his presentation, are very much engaged in regenerating our strategy, whether it's our TRADOC strategy or whether it's our acquisition logistics or technology strategy. And this is in keeping with the tradition uh, and the activities that we've seen in, uh, in past downturns. I'm also um, in the camp that uh, innovation and research is clearly uh, an opportunity to, uh, to deal with the world that we see out uh, the next few decades. Um, we have an opportunity, uh, and I'd like to call it an opportunity, to do a better job, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of more rapidly uh, inserting technology into our systems and into the field. And then finally, um, I'll talk a little bit about how we need to increase our commitment, not just at the national level, but at the Army level, and, uh, and certainly within labs and centers, our commitment to uh, science, technology, engineering, and math, because 
people really matter when you're talking about research. <coughs> Excuse me, next slide. I won't belabor this slide because we've heard from the PA&E, we've heard from General Barkley, and a lot of other people have talked about the fiscal, uh, the dire fiscal straits that we find ourselves in. Um, it was kind of interesting to hear on a first day, uh, somebody quoted Winston Churchill, now that we're out of money, we have to think. Uh, we're all familiar with the, uh, the, the, the common phrase, you know, necessity is the motherhood of invention. Well, we're there. Um, if, you, if you look at uh, the last two drawdowns, um, there's a lot of similarities uh, with this one. Uh, the one thing that I mentioned earlier that is different uh, for sure this time is there's no prospect of a peace dividend. It, the world is a much more dangerous and uncertain world. Uh, so, without belaboring the point, I would like to highlight, because I think it does help to reflect a little bit on where we've been. Uh, we not only see the, the decreases, uh, similar decreases in budget authority and reduction in force structure, but if you look at infrastructure, um, post-Vietnam and post-Cold War, we had uh, significant uh, consolidation with the defense industry. Um, in the post-Vietnam time frame, uh, a lot of people referred to those of us in the lab, and I was in the Army Aviation Lab at the time, as arsenals. So you had this uh, perception um, that the uh, Army s and community, the laboratory system, were really arsenals. And uh, we did have a significant amount of restructuring. In the post-Cold War area, uh, we had five BRACs. And we were able to do a lot of things under those BRACs that we were not able to do in terms of modernizing our labs and, uh, and, and improving the, the special purpose equipment and the capability of the laboratories. So we had significant consolidations within the RDECs uh, to where they are today. And we also had the uh, consolidation of all of our corporate labs into the Army Research Lab. Another lesser known, perhaps to many, uh, innovation was we went to the federated lab concept. And we used not CRADAs, but cooperative research agreements to where we actually shared the resources to do uh, collaborative research uh, with industry, academia, and the Army Research Lab. And we worked in each other's facilities to make best use of who had, uh, who had the best world-class facilities. That kind of collaboration has only got to intensify going forward, given the points I made earlier in terms of, uh, of the new sources, if you will, and availability of, uh, of technology. Uh, we also went through re-engineering of processes. Six Sigma caught on, lean manufacturing caught on. We did a lot of leaning out of organizations in our processes. Integrated product and process development, for example. And uh, a lot would characterize uh, the post-Cold War period as one of transformation. As we look going forward, uh, you see a significant increase in the uh, innovation that's coming from global sources and also commercial. We're going to have to tap into that. The good news is a lot of that is on the uh, cutting edge of what we need in terms of improving our material and our capabilities within the Army. Uh, on the downside, uh, Battelle just put out a report uh, working with RDA Magazine showing that uh, the R&D investment in Asia is greater than it is in the United States, and the United States is greater than it is in Europe. And that trend's been going on for the last few years and the percentage of GDP that the United States spends on R&D has been going down as well. Uh, that's not the right direction. You heard uh, earlier in the symposium about the notion of the Army Material Command's virtual lab. I think this is a great innovation because now we're gonna be able to network uh, <clears throat> not just individual projects, but we're gonna be able to network entire labs and reach out like we did in the uh, Federated Lab to our uh, partners and colleagues in industry and academia. Uh, we also see, are going to see the rebalancing of the generating and the operating forces. This is both a challenge and an opportunity. And we're going to be uh, continuing to work on regenerating our strategy, as uh, Paul mentioned that, that ASOLD is doing and Bill mentioned. So if I can go to the next slide. Now, <clears throat> in this slide, I've just tried to highlight some of the innovations in force structure or the force, if you will, training, technology, and acquisition, and try to look a little bit forward. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the initiatives that I think that will, uh, that will help us in this time of uncertainty and fiscal challenge. Um, if, we, if you just look at the post-Vietnam and the post-Cold War periods, uh, we tend not to realize how much innovation and how much change that we've gone through in these times where we had similar dramatic declines in resource, resourcing. 
Uh, Post-Vietnam, you had Air Land Battle Doctrine. You had all volunteer force in terms of the force. Post-Cold War, you had joint operations, the creation of BCTs. And you had, under General Sullivan's leadership, Force 21 and the Louisiana Maneuvers II and Army warfighting experiments. Uh, in the training area, post-Vietnam, we came up with flight simulators, individual simulators. We came up with the National Training Center and Miles laser technology. In the post-Cold War, we came up with SimNet. Uh, distributed simulation trainers. And from a technology standpoint, I've identified some of the things to include the Big Five that came out of uh, post-Vietnam. In the post-Cold War period, we were able to, as a result of our S&T investment and our technology demonstration and acquisition policies and working with the user, we were able to come up with digitization to move the Army into the digital age. We also had something that many of you participated in, which was called the second generation FLIR horizontal technology integration, so that our combined arms systems could all see the same thing with their FLIRs. Um, we also uh, came up with the Javelin uh, for the infantry. Uh, a little side story in terms of how uh, research and technology decisions can have a really profound effect. Uh, I would just like to point out that the IR Focal Plane Array Producibility Program, which was sustained by DARPA, actually saved the, uh, the AUSM program at that time. Uh, we were getting ready to cancel AUSM because we couldn't get the yield out of the Focal Plane Array. And because we had competing sources that had been developed uh, with DARPA uh, and the Night Vision Lab, when that time came, we were able to go to an alternate source, turn, you know, turn to our industry partners, and uh, save that program, and the rest is history, as they say. We uh, came up with uh, a GPS counter multiple rocket launcher, and we, and we of course, saw the advent of uh, UAVs. And I don't think Larry Lynn, who uh, started the ACTD program, desert, gets enough credit. His notion of tiered UAVs really, I think, had a lot to do with the fact that we actually have operational UAVs like we have with the Predator, Global Hawk, and other systems. So there was considerable innovation in both of those periods from a technology standpoint when we were in an austere period. And from an acquisition standpoint, uh, in the post-Cold War, we saw the advent of distributed interactive live virtual constructive simulation where we could actually uh, look at systems, uh, systems to where we could actually virtually prototype systems and see what they might contribute to the fight. We, we saw the creation, as I mentioned, of ACTDs, the Rapid Equipping Force, Rapid Fielding Initiative, Striker, and MRAP. Uh, the last two, of course, has, have been talked about in the symposium in terms of how we rapidly acquired those and fielded them. As we go forward, we're going to be regenerating our strategy. Uh, we're going to have to come up with uh, a force that's rapidly deployable, rapid force projection. And I would argue we really need a campaign uh, similar to what we had uh, in the post-Cold War period, a campaign of experimentation. Um, clearly, the NIE, I believe, uh, has to be part of that. Um, but I would also say, similar to the panel that we heard yesterday, uh, it has to make uh, sense from a business uh, case standpoint. It, the business model has to be right for all parties involved. Um, from a training standpoint, uh, we talk about the human dimension of the human environment. Uh, there's going to be a training revolution, whether it's leveraging massively parallel gaming, whether it's uh, leveraging virtual reality, uh, whether it's written, uh, leveraging our better understanding of, uh, through neuroscience. Uh, I think we're on the cusp of a training revolution. And I would say from a technology standpoint, we need to do a better job uh, than we've done in the past in terms of focusing and aligning and taking more of a project uh, uh, mindset uh, for our technology as it gets scaled up and starts to turn into capabilities that we want to transition. There have been a number of studies, some of which that I've participated in. You can look at the Decker-Wagner study from 2010. Uh, we have a transition problem. We have a transition problem. We have a lot of uh, good technologies, as Paul mentioned, that get left on the table, or it takes too long, or we don't have the risk uh, reduced uh, commensurate with what's needed. So I, I think uh, if you look at what the user is saying, if you take a look at what uh, the likely uh, future is, um, focusing around uh, concept technology demos, if you will, I'll just call them that, like owning the clock, to use a sports analogy where you have assured timely comms and you're pushing that down to the individual soldier and down to the small unit where he has, uh, uh, where the enemy has less of a parity 
uh, with our small units, the men at the tip and at the tip of the spear. Uh, that's a concept that we ought to be bundling our technology and our efforts around and looking at how we might transition that. The notion of a decisive soldier and small unit, um, wide area persistent surveillance, uh, technologies like Argus, um, time critical precision effects, uh, that just like we saw in the GPS uh, guided MLRS, that has a profound impact on reducing the logistical burden and, uh, and reducing the number of rounds that you have to have, uh, which should help in terms of rapid projection. And unmanned and manned systems teaming and looking at autonomy. These are all concepts uh, where the technologies are there. And I think if we bundle these and we align them with the warfighter, with the industry, uh, in the form of advanced concept uh, demos, uh, we can show what they're capable of doing and delivering and speed and ease uh, uh, transition of technologies. And as we look at acquisition, um, if you go back and take a look at, um, if you look at uh, Mr. Dan uh, Honorable Danzig's uh, paper, he lays out uh, very credibly the notion of uh, having a, a time-based acquisition process, which is really the DOD 5000 uh, system, coupled to a rapid acquisition process that will give us the capabilities we need when an event comes up. Uh, this is similar, of course, to what we've been doing for the last 12 years. And then you might have a hybrid system so that you really have uh, your major systems, which are going to be fewer of them, major new systems, are designed so that you have open architectures and you've anticipated uh, that you're going to try to capture technologies and put them into uh, either ECPs or product improvements downrange. But you don't know what the need is for that yet and you don't know what the technology is yet, but the system has been designed uh, to accept technology insertion in that way. And then robust pro prototyping, we've gotten away from prototyping. I think prototyping reduces risk. <coughs> and um, as we heard from the uh, uh, panel yesterday, candidly, we spend a lot of money on system integration labs. We spend a lot of money on NIE. We have developmental tests. We have operational tests. There's got to be a way to find in the community, in the testing community, requirements community, and acquisition community of leveraging that information that we get across those different activities so that we can reduce the cost of that collective activity. In other words, reuse. Next slide. So this is my final slide. Uh, for future readiness, we've seen restructuring and downsizing and process uh, re-engineering. They get you cost reduction and productiv uh, product, uh, productivity increases to meet budgetary pressures. They really don't regenerate your strategy or, or position you for more competitiveness or even to change uh, the nature of warfare in the future. That future readiness really requires an investment in strategic thought, your vision, your strategy, and your resource-constrained planning. That future is fraught with uncertainty and volatility, and I believe that calls for forecasting, not where you're looking and predicting a, a point solution in terms of what the future looks like at any point in time, uh, but rather forecasting with many scenarios so that you make sure that your forecast is not fragile and it decreases your chance of being wrong. We need a global understanding of emerging and disruptive technologies. Technologies like horizon scanning uh, will help in that regard. In fact, that's been used in the medical community uh, to great success. And we need red teaming like we used to have on the armor anti-armor program. Uh, Warfighting, gaming, and experimentation plus the NIE uh, once again, that has to have a business model that works for all. Uh, align the RDA leveraging uh, and core competencies with the strategy. And then hedge against uncertainty with real acquisition strategy options like I talked about. Fourth, a rapid innovation and diversity of solutions and competition will provide our options and the resilience to be ready for the unseen. Uh, of course, you have to have research because that's where you invent, that's where you generate new ideas, that's where you generate uh, new theories and understanding and knowledge. Uh, we really need to protect that because that's our seed corn for the future. At, a, at about $400 million, I think that uh, that's a wise investment for the Army. Advanced systems and concepts, candidly, I think we need to redouble our efforts in terms of having within the, uh, within the Army advanced systems and concepts offices that explore these various systems and concepts, robust competitive prototyping, um, and then you can read the rest of that. And finally, um, clearly we're going to have to make an increased commitment to our science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, we have a problem uh, in this, uh, in that uh, we have very few, compared to the other services, uniformed officers 
in our, in our laboratories. As we go forward and as we talk about partnering and collaboration and we talk about uncertainty, um, a number of studies have pointed out that we would, uh, we would serve, be well served if we could take a few of those officers with advanced degrees and allow them to get back into the laboratories like we used to have. We also have a problem where we're training um, increasingly large numbers of foreign nationals in this country to get their graduate degrees. Uh, we have to deal with this issue of how we can have the best and brightest with security clearances in this country. And then finally, uh, we need to redouble our efforts on chief engineers. A lot of our senior and experienced chief engineers, both in industry and in government, are retiring. It's aging. Systems engineers, cyber, and big data scientists. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you, George. Dr. Janopoulos? Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to begin, first of all, by saying that I'm truly honored to be on this, um, on this panel and feel a bit as, a, as an impurity because uh, the, my presentation is actually going to be focused on some basic uh, research results, but basic research, albeit related to the um, order of magnitude increase in improvement that, that General Hicks uh, mentioned. Uh, so hopefully uh, there will still be two or three people who will still be awake by the huh. end of this uh, presentation. I only have 137 slides full of equations and, uh, and text. So, so. Uh, in order to put the results that I will be presenting uh, in perspective and in context, I want to give you a very brief uh, overview of what the uh, ISN is. The ISN is a uh, uh, an Army UARC, a University affi uh, Affiliated Research Center. And the major goal is to try and help the Army dramatically improve the survivability of the soldier by working at uh, and extending the frontiers of nanotechnology through fundamental research, but also through transitioning with our uh, industry and Army partners. Now, nanotechnology is a buzzword, and there's a lot of hype associated with it. But there is one aspect of it that's really very important that goes beyond simply making things small. And that is that the intrinsic properties of matter become size dependent below a critical length scale of a few hundred nanometers. And what that means is, is that maybe we have opportunities here for new materials, phenomena, and properties that are unattainable in nature in normal bulk materials. Now, the, you're not guaranteed to get what you're after, but if you're successful, then there is the potential of actually doing something that's revolutionary rather than evolutionary in terms of a change. Now the ISN is actually a three-member team. There is the uh, facility on campus at MIT. There is the industry uh, consortium that is very important in doing transitioning. Raytheon, in fact, is one of our uh, key partners. And then there are our colleagues, our colleagues, scientists and engineers at the science uh, and technology labs. We have a large number of collaborations with uh, all of the, um, the labs and centers that are uh, pictured there. We also have uh, collaborations with SOCOM, with uh, more recently with the Air Force, with the Combat Rescue PJs, NAVC, and even more recently with the FDA and the Department of Agriculture, and that's because there are a lot of dual use aspects in what we do. Now, many of the projects that we have involved impact areas that are important for the Army and involve actually really unique technology that's developed being developed at, at the ISAN. I want to highlight just a, a few very, very briefly. One of them involves pro projects in detection and protection for all of these threats. Projects on enabling full body sensing, where in the uniform say it is the fiber or fibers that make up the uniform that actually are the optoelectronic devices. Uh, improvements in IR vision and UV communications. Improvements in health monitoring and treatment. And the last example is improvements in blast and ballistic protection through novel, lightweight, flexible materials and, mit and novel mitigation strategies. And it is this lat latter, this last uh, area that General Hicks wanted me to uh, talk about. And I'm going to mention a little bit uh, about how um, basic research um, could give us some sense of how reliable a, an order of magnitude increase in performance and mechanical properties uh, might truly be. My first example, the three examples, uh, the first example involves exploiting a unique deformation mechanism that actually, uh, actually exists only at the nanoscale uh, for dissipating significant energy without fracture. Now look at the plot on the left, at the bottom left. That's hardness versus grain size for a typical, say, um, a material, uh, say metal like nickel. And as you can see, the arrows pointing conventional 
nickel in its bulk form, typically has a grain size of about 10 to the fourth nanometers and a strength or hardness, say in this case, of one gigapascal in these units. Notice what happens now if you make nickel and you try and make it with smaller grain sizes. Notice you get at this huge enhancement in the hardness of the material. In fact, you get an order of magnitude increase when the grain size is on the order of 10 nanometers. As with everything, though, in research and in life in general, there's a big caveat here. And the big caveat here is, is that that material that you've made with 10 nanometers sized grain, grains is in, unstable. So after a few days, you're back to what you really started with. Now, it turns out that actually all pure nanomaterial metals or nanocrystal metals are thermodynamically unstable because of the large volume fraction of grain boundaries. And there's a cartoon there that I have that's showing you sort of grains on the order of 10 nanometers and the large open areas. And you can see how the atoms could diffuse and rearrange, and that's what they're going to do to make larger grains uh, as, uh, as time follows. Now, what this group did, shown on the left there with Chris Hsu and his collaborators, is they figured that if they alloy aluminum, I'm sorry, nickel, with another uh, element like tungsten, the tungsten would like to actually go to these grain uh, boundaries and tend to stabilize this type of structure. Now, if you look uh, at this uh, binary alloy, uh, it's well known if you look at all you know, textbooks and talk to any experts in the field, uh, this binary alloy has what's called an uh, enthalpy of mixing that's positive. Uh, ignore what I just said, but I'm just saying it to be <laughs> precise. Uh, what that really means is that if you look at the thermodynamic properties of this material system, uh, this is not the ground state. In other words, the system is not going to stay in this state. The atoms are going to move around, and what they really want to do is segregate into separate materials, tungsten and nickel. So that has been the conventional wisdom. Recently, however, this group uh, with Chris Hsu and his collaborators wrote a paper that appeared in Science Magazine, one of the key journals in, uh, for us in basic research, appeared uh, last year, just a few months ago actually, that proved that that basically conventional wisdom is wrong and that this nanostructured alloy actually is the thermodynamic ground state of the system. Now, I know all of you are sitting there saying, why is he making such a big deal about this? The reason is actually a practical one. That means that if you can make a structure, not, first of all, not if you can, that when you alloy these materials, this is the structure you're going to get, and it's going to stay that way. If you heat, heat it up, if you bang on it, no matter what you're going to do, this is the thermodynamic ground state of the system. Therefore, it actually is a new state of matter. And the amount of grain, or the size of the grains, is determined by how much alloy you put in, how much tungsten you put in. For small amounts of tungsten, you get large grains. For more amounts of tungsten, larger amounts of tungsten, smaller grains. By being able to control the grain size, you can explore the different mechanical properties. And what they found was that there's a magic number, around 10 nanometers in grains is when you get the maximum in hardness. You get also the largest rate dependence and pressure dependence as a function of strength of strength for these materials. Now this is nickel and tungsten that are heavy you know, uh, metals. The question immediately arises, can you do this with aluminum or aluminum alloys? These materials here weigh three times more than aluminum. So in order for me to show you what you can do with aluminum, first I want to show you conventional wisdom again. Okay? Here's a plot of hardness versus elongation at fracture. The uh, x-axis here, the horizontal axis, is ductility, a measure how ductile something is. So hardness versus ductility. And for steels and for uh, aluminum, conventional aluminum alloys. Now there are two important parts of this figure. The first is you see that the steels are a lot stronger than the aluminum alloys, but of course they weigh three times more. Also you see that things that are hard are not very ductile and things that are more ductile aren't as hard. Now, what this group found was that they could actually, if they were to alloy aluminum with a little bit of manganese, they would get a stable uh, nanocrystalline structure as shown in that uh, cartoon there. And here are the properties. What you've got here is the strength of steel with the weight of aluminum and the possibility of high ductility. 
But again, there's a caveat here. These samples that are in red are very small samples of materials. So we are working with our colleagues at Picatinny, at ARL, and one of our industry partners to scale up the process so we can make large enough materials to test these uh, predictions. So the jury is still out on this. However, being optimistic, we're still working ahead on trying to do computational modeling uh, of these types of systems. And we actually, as it turns out, we have colleagues at Tardec that we are working with uh, in this regard. I have two more uh, examples to give you, and then I'm done. The, third, the second example involves exploiting uh, certain size scale effects that occur in what are called super elastic alloys. Super elastic alloys are well known in the area of uh, material science and metallurgy. What they have that's very important is that there's a structural phase transition that occurs when they are stressed. So they can absorb energy during the structural phase transition without destroying the material. And usually the way one sees that is that one plots stress versus strain, as you can see there, and there's a hysteresis loop. That's that closed curve that you see there. And the amount of energy that is absorbed without destroying the material is the area, basically, within that curve. Now, that's the results for a bulk material of a super elastic made out of, in this case, copper, aluminum, and nickel. What's new, what's very new that was discovered by the groups that I, that I mentioned there is that if you go to the nanoscale, this is enhanced enormously. So you have a much more enhanced hysteresis loop and the area under the curve actually is an order of magnitude larger than the bulk, which means that you can absorb an order of magnitude more energy with a system like this. Mm. And my final example is really kind of far out, but I thought I'd throw it in anyway. Uh, being an academic, you know, I can do that. Uh, it's to explore design and synthesis of chain mail made out of carbon-based elements. So take a look at that little diagram that I have on the right, and it's made out of um, carbon nanotubes that you see as those, you know, it's what's, what's labeled CNT, and graphene rings and they're connected in just the right way to create a flexible but then super strong material. Now that is a cartoon. No one's made something like this yet. This is what we want to try and do. But it's not science fiction because by, by using regioselective chemistry we've actually made some of these uh, graphene rings and connected some of these carbon nanotubes. So, you know, work is moving along but I think it's going to be a while before anything like this is made. But if it is made then it could have some really superb quality, uh, properties, really a qualitative difference in how we do things. So this was just some, a few examples of, of what the ISN is doing. And the ISN really is only a very small part of what I think is truly an outstanding s and architecture that the Army has for supporting uh, this type of uh, basic research through the ARO, ARL, ARDEX, uh, UARCs and, uh, and in fact industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Last presentation at Fort Lauderdale, Bruce Schneider. <laughs> thank you. Again, I'd like to thank General Sullivan and General Hicks. And today I definitely am save the best for last kind of guy, last speaker, last panel, last day. So <laughs> hopefully you will enjoy it and I'll try not to dwell too long. Seeing as how I'm between the door and everybody here, but appreciate you sticking around. I'm going to talk about an in industry perspective on science and technology. I'm going to talk about how we view science and technology, how we integrate science and technology with what we do, and why we do it, and, and, and get into a little bit of the how. And, and again, you know, for us here, it's really about developing solutions to support the soldier. Raytheon, we're roughly a $24, $25 billion a year defense company. We build material solutions to support the soldier. That's really what we do. You can look at the chart and see the process that that follows. That's basically a very simple version of DOD 5000 that Mr. Singley talked about earlier from that standpoint. In, in their industry, in the services, in the Army, you know, we start out early research. Um, we as an industry develop uh, long-term roadmaps. We do mid-term roadmaps, we do near-term roadmaps, and we try and integrate that all together. It's really a partnership. 
The thing that we do, which is, I'd say, a little bit different or perhaps a little bit of expansive, when we look at this, we include the 6.1, 6.2, 6.3 categories of science and technology funding, but we also include 6.4, which is the demonstration and validation. And again, our, Mr. Singley talked a little bit about getting back to demonstrations. That's a key part of what we do with risk reduction. The thing I want to emphasize here, too, is independent research and development, or IRAD. Um, we invest order of magnitude half a billion dollars a year in IRAD. If you take a look at the S&T contracts that we execute in partnership with the DOD, you know, that pushes us well over a billion dollars in that left-hand side of that chart. There's, there's a lot of money there. We do good partnering. I'm going to talk today about perhaps some ways that we can look at doing more partnering. L look at us as a resource. That's how we look at the Army. Shape us, guide us, help us do that. We, we try and look at this process as an integrated process. We look at what the needs are. We look at what the challenges are. We look at what the requirements are. We look at the CDDs you publish. And then we couple that with the innovators in the industry. We couple that with the good ideas. We couple that with the art of the possible, again, to bring those solutions forward to really help the soldier from that standpoint. So it's a rather large, complex system, although there's a lot of simple threads that run through it. Um, I like this view of science and technology. This is the DOD science and technology funds and how they're distributed. And the reason I like this is because it really emphasizes the fact that we have to work together to be successful. If you go to the 6-1 side, you can see there heavy emphasis on the research side, heavy emphasis on the universities. That's why we do university partnerships. We do a few fairly significant, fairly selective. As Dr. Joe Anopoulos talked about the partnership we have with the Institute for Soldier Nanotechnologies. I'm proud to say we're in our second decade of that. Uh, we get a lot of benefit out of the work. We get a lot of knowledge out of the work. We get a lot of understanding out of the work. We also push on them. Uh, you, you saw earlier in the Army that their uh, work from before the Cold War on, on owning the night. On the, on, on the FLIR, in terms of working with second gen and HTI. We've been involved with that since the beginning, and part of what we do is drive requirements for owning the night back into the ISN. So as they work through advanced technologies like quantum dots, they can go understand where does this need to go to help support the soldier. So that's an important part of what we do. Not a lot of money involvement there, but a lot of helping to shape them. The middle point, the 6-2, I like to view that. That's the art of the possible. That's where we're going to take the research and the science and the early technology and say, can we really make something out of this? Get it into mid-TRLs. You, you see the funding's fairly broadly distributed there. It's industry, it's the labs, it's RDEC, it's the research universities, and so we really have to collaborate and work there. And then when you get into 6-3 side, you start to see industry taking leadership roles there in terms of the amount of funding. That's when we're pulling on the technologies, pulling on the proven capabilities, the proven science, and trying to turn those into demonstrations where we can take something in a field environment, not necessarily robust enough for the soldier, but say, will this work? Can we do this? Can we make it affordable, sustainable? And then begin to work those transitions on things that, that work. A lot of discussion this week about NIE. NIE is a, is a really good thing. NIE is a very rapid turn. Again, Mr. Singley mentioned it. Maybe we could do something to help facilitate those things that aren't quite ready for NIE, so nobody brings in something that's you know, not ready for prime prime for the soldier, yet could be a staging for that. I think, I think as you work through NIE and you bring more and more systems into it, you'll find out you need to move a little farther back in the pipeline to pull some of those things forward. Shape us. Help us do that. Basic research. Again, I mentioned our partnerships with the university. This is what the DOD publishes as a focus, and these are good areas. We support all of these things. Uh, most cases, we do partner. Another way to look at industry, we also are heavily involved in a few of these from a selective science standpoint. We do mergers and acquisitions. Raytheon recently, a couple years ago, bought a company called BBN. Uh, they have about 700 scientists in their company. They do quantum information science, and so we have resources on that end. One of the main reasons that we acquired BBN was a technology associated with Boomerang. Again, an area that support the Army. So, so where we can't find what we think we need to support the material solutions, we'll go out, acquire it, invest in it to bring it forward. Again, starting 
30 years, 10 years, five years, today. All of those are important to us. Um, other areas, more near term, and again, DOD S&T priorities, electronic warfare, electronic protection, cyber science and technology, counter weapons of mass destruction, complex threat environments. You can see the force multipliers out there, data to decisions, autonomy, engineered resilient systems, human systems. These are all in our lanes of what we need to develop as products. These are areas in the midterm that we actually invest in fairly heavily. We partner with, we partner with you, we partner across the company, we partner with other, other industries and universities to build these core capabilities. And that's what we look at. We look at building the core technologies, the core capabilities out of the science. So we've got a, a portfolio, or sometimes what we like to call as a toy box, to build things out of. So, and, and this is another area that, that is really critical and important. This is a particular term that's come out of the uh, OSD, the rise of the commons. These are new areas. You go look at the area of cyber. You go look at electromagnetic spectrum. You go look at space. You go look at the computing environment for cloud computing. These are relatively new things. They've come out of the commercial industry. The commercial industry is driving a lot of these developments. They provide both tremendous capability as well as providing threats. I'm sure everybody in here is aware of the cyber environment and what that means. Um, so, so again, looking at these capabilities not quite so simply as a, a research area or a particular material or the fact that you can go build electronics, but the fact that there's a lot of capability in here and again, a lot of building blocks. So what do we do with this? How do we leverage all this, again, to bring those in the material solutions? I, I wanted to bring this up in particular because this is something the Army has done, uh, particularly out of the Deputy Assistant Secretary for R&T, Mary Miller's office, that's very helpful for us. The, the more we get in terms of an understanding of column challenges, column requirements, column problems to solve, however you want to frame it, helps us focus. Innovation is critical to what we do, and we understand that. We need to bring the science and technology forward to provide those material solutions for the soldiers. Focus helps us. Guidance helps us. And I picked this as an example, Army Modernization Challenges. And you can see one there I've highlighted, you know, Mission Command and Tactical Intelligence. Even at this level, and you go look at that and say, okay, those are two very key challenges for the Army. There's convergence here that they wanted, want to do in terms of bringing this forward and making it more valuable. What do we do about that? Okay, so to talk about that a little bit, we had been investing for a while in an area we call tactical ISR to the edge. In other words, if you go look at the capabilities out there, what could we do to help support the soldier? If you look at the sensors that are on the battlefield and beyond the battlefield, if you look at the intelligence that assets that are available, the information that's available out there. You look at some of the technical capabilities that are available in terms of processing systems and cloud systems, communications capabilities, computers. All of a sudden you can say, well, you know, if we take Mission Command and Intel Convergence and we provide that, we, we can develop capabilities to support that. It's not yet a material solution, but it's the development the coalescence of a capability that allows you to help solve some of those really hard problems or the challenges the Army has to modernize. That's how we look at, again, the science and technology. Again, the integration from 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, 6.4, IRAD acquisition, however you want to bring those things together to provide capabilities like this. I, I like this example in particular because what it emphasizes, which is a lot of what I've heard for the last three days here, is the power of the network. A lot of discussion about the Army, a lot of discussion about the network, a lot of discussion about what the network can do. We like to view it as it's the power of the network that when you get it out on the battlefield and you bring everything together, allows you to provide capabilities like this that you can't do today. So that's a big emphasis of our, ours too. How can you bring the power of the network to the battlefield to help the soldier? The other thing I like about this, and I'll have to give credit to the Army because I think it's more their thinking than our thinking, and that's the tactical mobile cloud. One of the problems with bringing the power to the network to the soldier in the battlefield, frankly, is bandwidth. You know, it would be nice if we had fiber bandwidth 
everywhere in the universe all the time. You know, the soldier could pull out his iPhone, he could connect, he could get what he needs and only what he needs instantaneously. That's hard. That's really hard. But if you go look at solutions that can be put in place today, such as, well, we'll put a lot of the information in a tactical mobile cloud, and we'll provide as much network capability as possible, you can provide hybrid solutions today that really leverage that power of the network to the soldier and go forward. And then as we develop the technology, Dr. Joe Anopoulos over here fixes a lot of these really hard challenges, and we can continue to expand the capabilities of the networks, the technologies, and the capabilities. We can expand that, which is the evolutionary approach I heard talked about all week. So again, I, I use this as an example just to kind of give you a sense of what we do and how we think. We want the partnerships. We want to work together. The Army's done a great job of providing information to us in terms of what their challenges and problems. We use those to guide our investments and, and really go forward and develop those capabilities. So again, focus s and is critical. We partner with our research universities and buddies to go through those types of things. The more you can do to help us understand your requirements, your roadmaps, and your challenges, that will help us drive those far-term, mid-term, and near-term developments that we think will really help the soldier today and in the future. And with that, I'll say thanks and turn it back to General Hicks. Perfect. Um, one minute over. Be because of the, the content and the, and the great delivery, we, we're not going to be able to take questions right now. However, the panel will be available right after this for, uh, for those of you that wrote uh, some pretty yeah. piercing questions. And uh, I'm sure that... Uh, uh, the panel here would love to entertain those with you. And with that, I'll turn it over to General Sullivan. Okay. Okay, uh, this is terrific, absolutely terrific. I'm sorry more people couldn't uh, hear it, but I think it's a nice capstone to what has happened for the last three days and a nice beginning for what um, I will comment on regarding the next year's winter meeting. Don't ask me where it is, because I haven't decided yet, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, look, uh, this is a world-class symposium. I think it's been very successful, and I want to thank everybody, um, and we'll do so in a larger way with the message and so forth, but collectively it's been world-class, and uh, I think the Army got a lot out of it. I certainly know I did, um, and I want to thank our allies many of whom are still in the room, and they can thank their colleagues for uh, their participation. Uh, you bring a lot to the meeting, and we appreciate your coming. I want to thank Comdec, the EF Data, for sponsorship of today's lunch, for those of you who might need something besides an airport sandwich or hot dog that's been cooking in 7-Eleven for the last eight hours. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, we have another activity coming up in Honolulu in uh, April, 8 to 11 April. It's called Land Pack. The Army is in the Pacific. We have been in the Pacific for over 100 years, and we intend to stay in the Pacific as long as uh, there is the United States of America, I'm sure. And our next international trade show is IDEF in Istanbul, uh, Turkey. Uh, that's in May, 7, 10 May. This is the first time we've been to Turkey, and we're getting more space because we have more business from U.S. companies. So uh, come to Istanbul. We have a great bazaar, and you could probably get a rug. Um, okay, now look, um, I find this, this whole thing very exciting here. Um, how do we go from theory to practice? How do we go from the NIE in the labs into the hands of soldiers uh, in an effective way? And actually, in the last 20 years, we've come a long way. Some of the stuff that was talked about as accomplishments on uh, the charts, the last, the last one, and some of the other ones uh, were actually dreams back 20-some 20, 20 years ago. And it happened. But how do we get it from the NIE into the hands of the soldiers without relying on what happened, which essentially was a war and money became available and the stuff was on the shelf and miraculously it appears on the battlefield? 
Um, we can't always rely on that, and I think uh, that might be an avenue that we need to explore publicly to uh, give some illumination to that target. Better is better. Better is better. Smaller or bigger is not better. The money is not going to be there. How can we make the Army more effective, more protected, more lethal, more mobile, strategically and tactically, and uh, accomplish the mission? And I happen to agree, by the way, with our last speaker in saying that the flexibility that we need on the battlefield comes from the network. It's from the network. That's how we're able to do what we're able to do. And we can't run away and leave our allies. And we have to be in bed with each other on this effort, because I'll tell you, I don't think any of us, our enduring allies and the United States of America, is going to have the resources that we need to uh, do what has to be done. Um, and I don't even know what's going to have to be done. So anyway, um, thanks a lot to all of you. I appreciate it. Appreciate your willingness to come. Appreciate the companies who displayed uh, for doing that. And uh, I think it's been a successful meeting, and I'm not going to pull an International Olympics Committee kind of pronouncement about it. But thank you. I thought it was pretty good. Thanks a lot. <laughs>